Welcome to Deer Hunting for Beginners. This video is designed to provide a beginner's guide to deer hunting. Whether you're just curious about the basics or you're going to get into deer hunting or you've already gotten into deer hunting but you're still a beginner, this video should be a good resource for you to start with. With these explanations and easy to follow tips, this video is not only visually appealing, but also informative and hopefully engaging. So even if you don't wanna watch the video, you can still listen to the video and learn the important aspects of deer hunting. Hello everyone and welcome to the Beginner's Guide to Deer Hunting. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about everything you need to know to get started uh, in deer hunting. It's pretty exciting uh, and very challenging. First, we're gonna be talking about what deer hunting is and why is is so significant. So obviously, uh, if you've never deer hunted before, you might think that a bunch of people go out into the woods, uh, grab their guns, and just start blasting away at deer, and that's not really what it is. That might have been how people did it in the past, but these days, at least what the deer hunting I'm talking about, is not like that. Deer hunting is the practice of pursuing and killing a deer, and for most deer hunters, that means for meat. Some deer hunters do it for sport, and there are programs all across the U.S., at least that I know of, that uh, make it so hunters can donate the deer meat to homeless shelters and uh, places like that. Um, white-tailed deer have been around for a very long time. Um, they live pretty much everywhere, but let's really get a little deeper into this. Beyond hunting to have fun, beyond hunting for some sort of thrill, deer hunting is much more significant. It's a way that people connect with the outdoors, connect with mother nature, um, and sharpen their survival skills. Back before people could go to grocery stores, we had to find our food somewhere else. And hunters understand how to find food outside of a grocery store, outside of a market, and outside of trading. They make their way into the woods, and they're able to find a deer, shoot the deer, track it down, field dress it, bring it home, put it in their freezer. Now, there's obviously a lot involved in that process, and it's not quite as simple as I made it sound, but I'm going to continue on. Um... In this guide, what I'm going to be doing is trying to go over every detail I can think of uh, for everything you need to get started deer hunting. And from gear to techniques, uh, everything I can think of, I'm going to be trying to share it with you. So let's get going. All right, so now let's talk about deer behavior and habitat. Uh, let's start out off with deer behavior. Uh, deer are social animals and they live in herds. Now, uh, they are active usually during dawn and dusk, but you can find them at night or during the middle of the day. When you're going to find a deer is typically when it's going to food or water. <clears throat> during the day, deer oftentimes will go to thick cover and lay down, and that's so that they can stay safe from predators. If you understand the times that a deer is active, you're going to be a lot more successful. You'll be able to plan your hunt a little bit better. Um, but it's not just about when they're active. You also need to understand deer behavior. Now, if you've been watching hunting videos or have gone out on a hunt with somebody else and you've heard a deer grunt or make like a bark sound, um, that can be indications of several things. A deer can grunt for social reasons. A deer can grunt um, or bark when they feel that there's a threat. Um, a snort can mean that they detected a presence of something foreign like a human or other animal, um, but they haven't really identified you know, where that is. So they're kind of trying to figure that out. There's also contact grunts. Um, a deer might be just making a grunt to try to get the attention of other deer. Now, there's a lot more to deer calling, but if you understand a buck grunt 
and a doe grunt, and you understand an estrus bleat, you'll be off to a great start. So a buck grunt is a low guttural sound that's going to be made by a buck, which is the male deer, if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, bucks use them to attract females, warn others about, um, you know, to get out of their territory. A buck will also often uh, grunt a few times, like meh, meh, meh. Um, to try to assert dominance or show off to potential mates. Uh, a doe grunt is a high-pitched nasal sound made by a female deer. Uh, and what she uses that for is to give her location to other deer and to communicate, um, usually during the breeding season. Um, a, doe will often, a doe will often use a series of grunts to attract a buck's attention uh, especially when she's ready to mate. And that's where I'm getting into the estrus bleat. The estrus bleat is a series of high-pitched crying sounds made from the female deer during estrus. When she's in estrus, that's when she's most fertile and uh, ready to breed. Um, basically, what she's telling the male deer is that she is ready to mate. So now we're going to be talking about scouting and selecting your hunting spot. Scouting is a critical part of hunting and it can make a difference between your it basically what it can do is make a huge difference between how successful you are if you haven't scouted and you don't understand anything about the area you're in you may not have any success at all unless you just get lucky um so what you want to do is you want to look for areas that have Food, water, and cover. Um, you also want to consider terrain, the direction of the wind, and your access in and out of the area. So to start out, what I'd recommend doing is looking at a map. You know, look at the area you're hunting, assess the topographical feature of the map, and then find water. Okay, so you know that deer need water, and they also need cover, and they also need food. So if you find those three things, you might have a place to go physically scout. You want to use Google Earth. Uh, that's another great thing you can do as well to find out, am I looking at a lot of hardwoods? Am I looking at a lot of evergreen trees? What's the land like? Is, is this going to be farmland? Uh, that's very important. You want to have an idea of the landscape you're going into before you physically scout that area. Uh, once you get into the area, what you want to do is... Uh, potentially set up trail cameras. But the only way you know if you should be setting up trail cameras in most cases is by stepping into the area and looking for deer sign. Deer sign can be um, deer scat, scrapes, rubs, and deer beds. So scat self-explanatory. I would pay almost no mind to old dried up scat that doesn't give an indication if a deer's been here recently. Um, scrapes are where a deer has used its hooves to uncover bare ground, basically like dig into the ground. And what they'll also do is rub their antlers or chew on, um, a twig hanging down. Oftentimes a deer will just kind of go like that or chew on it a little bit and then they'll make a scrape right below that. A rub is where a deer has used his antlers, basically Rubbing off the velvet is one thing they do, but also use it to mark their territory. So if you see a tree that's been rubbed down by antlers and all the bark is gone from that tree, you have a you have deer sign. Uh, lastly, you're looking at deer beds. So a deer bed tells you that that is where that bed that deer comes to lay down. And it's left behind signs of its presence, like impression in vegetation. But here's something to note. Just because you found a deer bed, just because you found a rub or a scrape, just because you found something doesn't guarantee that deer are going to be there. Okay? If a scrape or a rub was made a week ago and it hasn't been touched, it may no longer be active. I know. Captain Obvious, right? Just keep in mind that you're looking for fresh sign not old sign from years past. All right, so now we're gonna talk about tracking and following deer. So deer tracking 
can be frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and even if you do know what you're doing, it can still be a challenge. If you understand the way that deer behave, you understand their habitat, tracking is a little bit easier. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is look for fresh tracks. And that's what I have on the screen right here. You're looking at deer tracks right there where a deer has clearly stepped in the mud and made an imprint. Now, you don't know how fresh this is. If the dirt is all dried up, uh, it's probably old. Um, if it's a fresh track, it's going to have probably a more clear imprint and there's not going to be debris all in the track. So if you're looking at a track like this, it looks like there's debris in it. It doesn't really look that fresh. So we're not going to be worrying too much about it. <clears throat> you look at the track, look at the way the deer is going. That's really all there is to a track. Now, by looking at a track, you may be able to find more signs such as those scrapes, those rubs or deer beds. But a deer track is a good way to get on deer and find exactly where they're going and kind of get in the area to find that other sign. So how, to, so how should you be moving when, you, when you're tracking a deer? Let's say you're following tracks like this. You want to walk slowly and quietly. Um, you may feel like you're moving at a snail's pace, but that is the best way to track. You're going to be able to notice things better than if you're walking fast. You won't have to be worried about tripping over things. You'll be able to stay quieter, which won't alert the deer in the area. Deer are, their senses are amazing. So before you even know they're there, they're probably already running away. So at all times, you need to be as much like a ghost as you can be. Stay very quiet and move very, very slowly. Um, the idea is... Eventually, these tracks are going to move into an area where you're going to find a scrape, a rub, or something else. Now, if you find one track and you decide to follow one deer's track, it may lead to nowhere. But if you find a pattern of tracks, many tracks headed in the same direction, that is a good sign. All right, guys, I'm back. Uh, it's the next day. I have my notes pulled up, and we're going to jump right into this. We're going to talk about wind and scent. All right, so I've got a diagram over here. I've got my notes over here. So you're going to see me looking back and forth, trying to keep on track here. <clears throat> um, as you can see on this diagram, pay attention. The wind is coming from right to left. The deer are to the left. And the stand location is further to the left. So if we want to talk about cardinal direction, that would be wind is blowing from east to west. The deer are at the edge of the field on that west side of the field right up there in the corner, which is a good place to, uh, it's like a staging area for deer. That's what a good buddy of mine taught me. And that scent is, that sorry, that stand is just a little bit deeper into the woods so that Instead of blowing the scent from the stand to where the deer are, the deer scent is getting blown to the stand. You want the wind in your face. That's a generally good idea. Anyway, um, pay attention to this diagram as I talk about wind and scent because it might help things make a little bit more sense. Always, when you're hunting, you want to pay attention to uh, the wind direction. Uh, if the wind is blowing um away from the deer and towards you that is a good thing if the wind is blowing away from you towards the deer that is a bad thing um you can use all sorts of things to check the wind um some guys will get a little thing of powder they squeeze some people will pick up some dirt and drop it and see which way the dirt falls um you know a leaf uh, there's all sorts of ways to check which way the wind is blowing, but you need to keep a good idea of how the wind is at all times when you're hunting. If you play the wind, your success will probably be a lot higher. If you don't play the wind, you better have very good scent control or other measures in place to get those deer close to you without spooking. Um, so here's the scent control aspect of this. If you wash your hunting clothes with, uh, let's say it's Tide or 
gain or some other scented detergent, you're going to smell like clean clothes. Those scents aren't necessarily natural in the woods. And you might get away with hunting with clothes that have just been washed regularly. But if you want to optimize your scent control, you want to use a scent-free um, detergent. Um, I also recommend getting some sort of scent eliminator spray to spray on your clothing, your boots, and your hat. Uh, and I would uh, also think about spraying it on your equipment as well. Uh, they're all, they also make soap, uh, scent-free soap, to eliminate that body odor as well. So if you want to go whole hog on this thing and really play the wind and scent game to the best of your ability, those, that's what I would tell you. Keep the wind coming, going from the deer to you and take every measure you can to eliminate your scent. Um, okay, so right here, I don't know if, you know, to the layman, you might just see some barren land and some woods. A hunter, when he looks at this, probably understands that that barren land is a food plot and those woods provide cover, shelter, bedding areas, for the deer, also more food in the woods as well. Um, so as you're looking at this, you wanna take into account the wind direction and your location to the food plot. All right, so uh, finding it in my notes here. Basically, you wanna hunt downwind from the food plot, so the wind is blowing from the food plot to you. Um, deer like to move with the wind in their face, so That'll happen from time to time, but if you do this correctly and you follow basically this little picture here that I've got pulled up, put your stand deep in the woods, not too deep, right, um, but giving the deer enough room to stage and move out to that food plot somewhere near a corner, um, you're going to play that wind correctly. Um, and again, hunting, dawn, dusk. Those are the times that you're going to be most successful with this, but it doesn't mean that a daytime hunt couldn't yield great results. All right. Uh, another thing is when you're tracking, when you're scouting, when you're blood trailing, you should also take into control, uh, take into account uh, those scent control measures and the wind. Uh, it is not just for choosing a location to hunt. It is also for while you're moving. So if you're moving, try to keep that wind in your face as much as possible. Um, move very slowly. Try not to move so fast that you're pouring in sweat. Uh, if you're hunting in the south where it gets really hot, there's probably not much you can do other than take those scent control measures that I outlined before. Uh, uh, again, make sure you're spraying down those boots if you're moving a lot because you do not want to be leaving your scent all over the woods. Um, yeah, so that's the down and dirty on wind and scent. All right, so now we're going to talk about decoys and calling. Um, decoys are not necessary, and they are not required for you to have massive amounts of success in the deer woods with hunting, okay? But if you do use decoys and you are thinking or you are thinking about using decoys, you should probably understand a few things first. Um, so obviously, uh, a hunter understands that a decoy is basically a fake deer, something that's going to get the attention of another deer and bring it in closer. A decoy, unless it has audio hooked up to it, is something for when a deer is within your sight and can see that decoy, but you want to bring it closer to make that shot. Um, decoys can draw in bucks, they can draw, and they can draw in does. They can also draw in predators. Um, so if you're going to think about using a decoy, understand that you might draw in other animals. <clears throat> Uh, you want to choose a decoy that looks as realistic as possible and is not uh, going to fall apart in the elements. If you have some sort of cheap or homemade decoy out there that falls apart as soon as it rains, it's not going to be effective. The deer are going to look see right through it. Okay. Um, as far as choosing a location for your decoy, I don't personally use decoys, so I looked up 
uh, choosing locations for decoys. And basically it's right, right there with what I thought. You're gonna place that decoy right in between basically that scent line between you and the deer. If the wind is blowing from the deer to you, okay, or where you think the deer will be, you're gonna put that decoy in between, such as if you're sitting off the side to that food plot and you're deep enough in the woods for those deer to have a staging area, you maybe put that decoy just between where you and that deer would be. And you obviously want that decoy close enough to you that you can make a shot. For bow hunters, I would definitely recommend putting that decoy within 25 yards. All right, um, now let's talk about calls. As you can see, this guy right here, he's using a grunt tube. Um, we can't tell for sure if he's doing a butt grunt or not. Um, but essentially what calls do is make deer sounds and it is a way to communicate with deer in basically whatever they can hear, which their ears are very good, whatever they can hear. If it's a sound of a deer and it's convincing enough, you may be able to convince that deer to come check it out and see what's going on over there. Um, there are grunts, bleats, estrus bleats, um, and more. There's also rattling. That's another aspect of calling, which I will talk about a little later. Um, but the idea is when you go and you look for a call, look for something that is quality, look for something that has um, accurate sounds. You don't want a deer call that sounds nothing like what you've heard. And I would highly recommend going on YouTube and listening to real deer sounds if you don't know what deer actually sound like so that when you're picking out a call, you can try to make that sound as close as possible to what you know a real deer sounds like. Um, all right, and using a call, okay? So depending on what kind of call you use, um, there are different techniques you might use, but the thing about using the call is you don't want to be using it every five minutes just blowing up the deer woods. You want to use that call sparingly. Um, you want to kind of like start slow and then uh, maybe start slow, maybe start quiet and then increase your volume as you go. But be patient. When you're not calling, sit still. Be very aware of your surroundings. Deer can move in on your location, especially if you're bow hunting and you and you don't have, you know, 150, 300 yards to shoot. You only have 30 yards to shoot. You want to let that deer get close. So you're going to need to stay very, very still. Deer can move in and be right underneath your tree stand or right outside your blind or without you even knowing if you're not paying attention. So pay close attention. Um, yeah, so that's the down and dirty on calling and decoys. There's a lot more to it, but let's get into the next segment. All right, let's talk about different weather conditions. Uh, weather conditions can kind of help you decide if you want to get out there and hunt, how you want to get up out there and hunt, and give you a better understanding of where the deer might be. Now, just because it's snowing outside, raining outside, hailing, just because there's a thunderstorm, just because it's hot or cold does not mean that it is some sort of steadfast rule that deer will do this every single time, okay? Um, we're going to talk about just generalizations, but there are many exceptions to these rules, okay? Hunting uh, in the rain um, is one huge part of it. Um, it. A lot of people don't like hunting in the rain. I'll tell you, I've had a lot of success hunting in the rain. If the rain stops, deer oftentimes like to come on out and I've had success harvesting deer uh, in several seasons right after the rain stopped. Uh, okay, so think about what rain might do to a deer. Rain most likely will make a deer want to go find cover and bed down. Um, basically just get out of the rain is what they're trying to do. They live in the wilderness. They don't live in living rooms like this. So when it rains, it's not as big of an effect on them as it is on us. Remember that. Rain can be your friend. It can help cover up your scent. It's really nice to go out and scout right before a rain. 
because right after you get out of there, your scent will be washed away. That's a, that's a really nice thing. Um, I would tell you this, if you're going to hunt in the rain, hunt more in the light rain than a heavy rain. Hunting in a thunderstorm probably isn't a good idea, so I'm not going to tell you to do that. And I don't know if I've seen many deer when there's thunderstorms happening. Um, so let's talk about heavy winds. Um, if the wind is blowing really heavily, that means your scent can get carried faster. But if it's blowing and, and it's very blustery, that can mix up that scent and kind of cover it. Um, if the wind is blowing heavy towards you, blowing fast, blowing hard towards you, in your face, away from the deer, it's going behind, and the, that wind is going to carry your scent behind you. That's not not a bad idea. Now, the thing about wind is, if it is really windy, you might have a really hard time getting that shot off. And I would consider maybe not hunting when it's too windy if you think that your shot will be affected. Uh, we always want to make good ethical shots on these animals and provide them with the quickest death possible. Um, uh, when it comes to re uh, wind, another thing I have written right here is look for, you can determine like where you want to sit based on wind and how that wind is blowing. If the wind is blowing fast, maybe you don't want to sit right on the edge of a food plot. Maybe you would like to sit down in a draw where you're kind of out of the wind. If it's really cold and windy, that might make your hunt really miserable. Uh, hot weather. If you're in hot weather hunting, then you probably live in the south. Um, and let me tell you something. I've hunted in the heat a lot. I've harvested deer when it's pretty hot outside. So I'll tell you, it's not necessarily, um, it's not going to kill your, your whole hunt. It's not the end of the world. But as a rule of thumb, if it's not hot usually, and then one day it's hot, deer might bed down. Um, they're going to seek shade. They're going to seek water. That, that's going to help you determine where you want to hunt. You might want to hunt near a water source. You might want to hunt near a thicket. Um, I don't know that a deer isn't going to go out and do the regular things that they normally would do. But as a rule of thumb, you hunt early morning, late evening. Um, you'll be hunting the coolest times of the day. And your odds will probably be a little higher. All right, what about if it's really cold? Um... I have had a lot of success seeing deer and harvesting deer in cold weather. When, Since I live in the south, when it goes from a 60 or 70 degree day to a 30 or 40 degree day, I tend to see a lot more deer. Those deer start running around and that's when I see a lot of rut activity. But generally, I've had a lot of success in the cold weather. I would tell people if it's cold, get out there and hunt. You can bundle up, you can wear five pairs of socks, I don't care what you do, but if it's cold, I would recommend to get out and hunt. Now, if it's below zero, if if you're talking about, you know, freezing temperatures, you're risking your life to go harvest a deer, um, that's gonna be your risk to take. I'm not telling you to do something like that. I've hunted in freezing temperatures before and had no issue. So if you're prepared, it's not a big deal at all. And if you hunt north of here, basically anywhere outside the south, you've probably hunted in freezing temperatures before and you probably understand that there's just certain measures you're going to need to take to ensure that your safety and your health is protected. Um, but as cold weather relates to deer, um, you will oftentimes see during a cold snap deer movement pick up and rut activity start. You're talking about bucks chasing does. You're talking about does, you know, running all over the place essentially. And uh, it's kind of a fun time to be out there. So now let's talk about snow. Um, snow, depending on the environment that you live, here in the south, snow would be not something that happens all the time. I don't necessarily think that it would stop the deer from moving, but it's not exactly the same type of, 
I wouldn't give the same the person the same advice that lives in the South that lives in Alberta, Canada, for example. Um, here's some universal truths about snow, though. If you do shoot a deer, tracking that deer, blood trailing that deer, will be a lot easier, most likely. You will be able to identify drops of blood and you'll be able to see where that deer ran if there is a foot of snow on the ground and all it is is white drops and footprints and powder. You're going to follow that and you're going to be, you're going to have a great time. Um, now, if there's so much snow on the ground that it's hard for you to move, that could mean that you are making tons of noise and alerting the woods of your presence. It's not something you want to do. So take into consideration how much snow is on the ground and if you're going to risk uh, lighting up the woods with your presence. All right, so now let's talk about shot placement. Let's say you've followed all of these tips for beginners getting into deer hunting and now there's a deer in front of you 20 yards away. Where do you aim? Let's talk about it. So as you can see, I have this little picture pulled up and the crosshairs are right where the heart should be, okay? There is that triangle, and you want your bullet, your arrow, to go right in that triangle. Now, outside of that triangle, there's actually a lot of areas that you could shoot a deer and kill it. So, it is not 100% only shoot here, but this is the tried and true death zone for a deer. These are the vitals, that's the shot. If you punch an arrow through that, you put a, two, a 243 or 30 round through that, uh, that deer is dead, and I feel very, very confident in saying that. Now, if you look just outside that triangle, a little bit back on the deer's body, there's more of the deer's heart to be seen, there is uh, a lot of lung to be seen. If you hit a double lung shot, that's also a great shot. Okay, um, now let's talk about how the deer is standing. Okay, so if the deer is standing broadside just like this, facing either to our right or to our left, we are going to aim right there in the middle of that triangle. Basically, think about aiming just above the leg, not too high on the shoulder or you'll be hitting that, uh, that shoulder bone. Um, you wanna put that arrow or that round through both lungs and the heart. You want to give that deer the quickest death possible. If the deer is quartering away, you want to aim a little back uh, on the deer. So you are aiming um, more on the center of its body so that arrow can come out just, you know, basically what it's going to happen is instead of shooting it broadside where you just, oh, excuse me. instead of shooting it broadside, Imagine my cell phone's the deer and this is its head. Instead of shooting it broadside like this, now let's have it quarter away. Okay, so now we're gonna have to aim a little bit back further so that the arrow or the round actually goes through the vital areas entirely. You don't wanna aim too far back to where you miss them, but if you aim too far forward, that round will not be going through many vitals at all. Um, center of the chest, basically just behind that front shoulder, but I would take it back just a little bit. Um, if it's quartering to you, uh, this is where you're gonna need to be careful. If you hit that shoulder, that deer will likely run off with an arrow in it, or, um, you know, especially if you're bow hunting, or a round lodged in his shoulder, that may not be a good thing. Um, if you're sh shooting with a powerful enough rifle, you should be okay, but, what you want to do is you want to aim for basically if it's looking right at you you want to aim for the center of the chest i shot my buck last year it was looking right at me it picked its head up i waited for it to pick its head up and i let the arrow loose i was 20 probably you know 20 30 feet up in a tree it looked up right at me i let the arrow loose i made a sound to get it to look up at me and it didn't run more than 30 yards there was a blood trail that was crazy and there's a hole this big it right there on the deer uh, basically as it looked up um, that's what my broadhead did 
if it's uh, facing uh, directly away from you, let's say you're looking down on, down at it, think about where those vitals would be and kind of look at where those crosshairs are. So you don't want to hit the shoulder. You want to get that arrow right in those vitals though. So you might aim just to the left or, or to the right of the uh, spine and try to put it right where you think that heart's going to be. Watch out for that shoulder bone. Um, here is something that I would tell you when considering, you know, where you need to shoot on a deer before you've even gotten to that part, you need to be an excellent shot. If you are bow hunting, you need to be spending a lot of time practicing shooting. And I mean, practicing shooting from the ground, from a tree stand, from a blind, in your hunting clothes, with all your gear on in different weather elements as well. If you practice in the summer, but you're not used to shooting when it's negative five degrees outside, that could be a major issue. Practice in similar weather and, and try to make everything as real as possible. Now you may not be shooting a real deer when you practice, but that should be the only difference if you can do that. So now that we talked about shot placement, let's talk about other ethical considerations and factors that you should take into account uh, to become an ethical hunter. Um, so we already talked about shot placement. You wanna give that deer the quickest death possible. You do not want to wound a deer. Um, you do not want to make a deer suffer any more than it has to. The idea of a hunter going into the woods in my eyes and, and harvesting a deer is we go into the woods and that deer up until the time where we shot it and killed it lived a natural life to the best of its ability. Unharmed, unfettered, nothing happening from humans um, directly. Of course, there's many aspects of humans living on planet earth that affects animals, but as far as that deer's life, it's just living a deer's life until the moment you harvest it. If you compare that to cattle or anything else um, that's raised on a farm and then slaughtered, I would say that deer probably had a much better life, but that's a matter of opinion. Um, you wanna respect the animal that you're hunting. You're not going out there to just kill deer. You're hunting and harvesting deer. Uh, killing the deer is part of that process. Um, after you've killed the deer, now you're in the process of taking that meat and getting it home in your freezer or giving it to other people who need it. Uh, doing something that's actually right with that deer's body I think will go a long way. And keeping that in mind, there is no reason to hunt if you're just going to do it to kill animals. I'm going to say that one more time. There is no reason to hunt if you are just going to do it to kill animals. Um, you should always follow the rules and regulations, laws, Everything that's required. As you can see here, we have a beautiful deer standing right on posted private property. An unethical hunter may shoot this deer. That unethical hunter is called a poacher. They are felons. If you want to become a felon, if you want to poach deer and trespass on people's land to do so, I would say that you should not be deer hunting at all. Give it up. Go do something where you're not taking someone's life or an animal's life, rather. Give it up. Go do something where you're not taking an animal's life and trespassing on people's land to do it. It's just not right for you. Um, if you can't respect another person's property, another person's land, uh, deer hunting is not something that you should be doing because I have seen beautiful deer on a lot of private property and... I respect that as much as I possibly can. There is no reason for me to walk onto that private property, okay, unless I have permission, which I would recommend written permission, from the landowner. 
If you have written permission from the landowner and you're following state and, le state and local and federal laws, I would say you're off to a great start. Make sure you have good shot placement. Practice a lot. I don't care if you're shooting with a weapon that's easy to shoot and you never miss. You should still practice a lot. Um, respect the wildlife that you encounter. Even though your aim is to harvest a deer, you should respect that deer. Follow your laws, follow your regulations, respect people's property. If someone does not want you on their, on their property, do not go on their property. If you don't have permission to go on private property, just because there's not a posted sign doesn't mean you should go on that property. Always get permission. Um, and think about, you know, who you are as a person, that ethical framework that you grew up with, that moral framework that you grew up with, and try to be true to that person when you're out in the woods, you know, respecting wildlife. All right. So let's talk about private versus public land and tips for hunting each one, assuming that you have permission to hunt on that private land, of course. So public land is going to be something that you're going to have to find out about on your own. You're going to have to do some research about that. Um, I have a map actually sitting right here above my computer, and that's showing me some Corps of Engineer land that I pay each year for a permit to access. Um, there's also some federal land that I also hunt on as well. Most of the land that I hunt on is land where other people are using. It is public land. Um, I do hunt on private land, but the private land I hunt on ends about 300 yards that way. And, uh, yes, I have harvested deer in that small area, but <clears throat> most of my hunting is done on public land. So right here, you can see this is an Iowa habitat and access program. There's certain types of hunting and, uh, allowed, but, uh, this would be an example of a place you might choose to hunt. <clears throat> Another example of a place you might choose to hunt is your property. Let's say you own a few acres. Let's say you own 10, 20, 30 acres, and you want to try to get a deer on your own property. That could be another place you hunt. The strategies for hunting each of these places might be a little different. Um, public land, depending on where you're hunting, let's say it's a national forest, there is just so much space that maybe you'll never see another person but if you are hunting somewhere where that's public but it's not a lot of space the odds you're going to run into another hunter is a lot higher you're going to need to think about um those interactions with other hunters how you're going to de-escalate those situations most people are good people but you do not want to be walking in to another hunter's area ruining his hunt and if you do, you should be prepared to get out of there and basically be as respectful as possible, knowing that you've likely spoiled that part of his hunt. Uh, the woods will calm back down and it'll be okay, but you don't generally want to get in there and ruin another person's hunt. Um, if you choose to hunt public, that's the risk you are going to run. You could have a car drive by at any time. You could have a person walking through your area that you're hunting. There's a number of factors that, uh, that come into play. Um, if you like competition, public land is probably a great place for you to go. If you just want to get the biggest buck possible, private land is probably the place where you should go. Because if you're hunting private land, that means hundreds or thousands of people aren't accessing that land. It's probably controlled. And if it's controlled, you might talk about a handful of hunters, depending on the size, hunting that area. <clears throat> um, as far as private land, like I said before, um, you need permission. If it's not your land, get permission. And the type of permission I would ask for is written permission. If you trust somebody's word, that's one thing, but written permission is something that you can go, oh, well, here you go, Mr. Game Warden, sir. Um, this guy wrote me this note with his signature on it, and at least they have you have something to show for it. Um, okay, other aspects of private versus public hunting. In the area you're hunting, public, you might have different regulations and different rules than you would on private. 
And I know that goes for where I live, but I would just take that into consideration before you go out and decide to hunt, decide to hunt public. You know exactly what the rules are hunting that location, what weapons you're allowed to use, the bag limits, um, antler size, all that stuff needs to be taken into consideration. Another thing that you might run into when hunting in on public land and dealing with other hunters is hearing calls. Um, something that I've run into a lot is hearing a lot of rattling. Definitely people making the noises because it doesn't sound natural and you just hear it all the time. That's something you're going to have to deal with. Could be scaring the deer off. Could be drink, bringing deer in for you. Um, but you're going to have to deal with both aspects of that. You're going to need the correct licenses. Um, you're also going to need most likely some sort of hunter education. Nowadays you can do that online. I highly recommend doing your hunter education class now. Um, safety is paramount. You need to understand that with other hunters in the woods and even without other hunters in the woods, there are so many factors you need to take into consideration. And the fact that while you're deer hunting, you're holding a weapon that has a power to take a life you need to respect that power and you need to understand that power and understand how to be safe while holding that power in your hands. Um, <clears throat> every state, so like on this picture right here, I have the Montana Fish and Wildlife or Fish, Wildlife and Parks, uh, some licenses pulled up. Every state's going to have different hunting regulations, different licenses uh, or permits, depending on how it is. Some, some states are going to require you to actually like tag the animal or put something on the animal. Some states are not. Um, you're going to need to find out what your state requires. So typing in uh, in Google a search like Montana deer hunting regulations, uh, Montana deer hunting permit requirements, stuff like that, that might get you started <clears throat> if you lived in Montana, of course. Um, so you're going to need to make sure that you have the fees covered and your safety course done and to keep that information with you. So you want to keep your license, your hunter safety card with you, um, your identification card. Just in case a game warden does come up to you, you want to be fully prepared and be like, okay, yeah, you want him to understand that you've gone through the steps to be prepared for him to approach you and ask you for the required licenses. Okay. Now, if a game warden comes up to you and you are saying, well, I don't really know. Uh, I think I left it in the truck or I'm not really sure where it's at, but I know I bought it. That's not going to, I don't think that's going to help you as much as if you were to pull out a waterproof case of some sort or a plastic baggie with all of that information in there and say, here it is. It's all here. Even if you had to look through it, you have a baggie. You have something with a bunch of documents in there that's just specifically for if a representative of the law comes up to you and asks you about your hunting, you can prove that you're doing it legally and you're doing it the right way. <clears throat> Um, there's really not much more to it. Understand your state laws, understand federal laws, understand the rules of where you're hunting, follow them, be an ethical hunter. Uh, let's get into the next segment. All right, so next we're going to talk about blood trailing. Right here I have a picture. This is from a hog that I shot. Um, I like to take pictures as I blood trail just so I can stay on track and know exactly uh, you know where I've been at. Oftentimes I will also... When I am in the blood trailing process, I'll either mark my map or mark a spot on my phone to try to generally keep a sense of direction on where I'm going with that blood trail. <clears throat> so right here, if you look at this blood closely, you can get an idea. I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger for us. I want you to take a look at this blood. <clears throat> so this is pretty bright and it's got some bubbles in it. If you look closely, you can kind of see that um, when the blood has bubbles and it is bright, that often means it is a vital hit. You hit the lung uh, at the very least, and you know that should that means something good. Now you can single lung, you can double lung. A single lung is going to take a lot longer, well, considerably 
longer for that animal to die in most cases than a double lung shot. Now, if you hit it through the double lung and the heart, much faster. <clears throat> um, so what exactly is blood trailing and how do you do it? If you haven't figured it out by now, blood trailing is identifying drops of blood from that deer that have that after the deer has run off and tracking down that deer by following that blood trail. If if you don't if blood trailing sounds like something that you are not willing to do, deer hunting is not for you. You need to understand that after you've made this shot, you have the responsibility to track down this deer and harvest it. Wounding a deer or letting a deer rot in the woods because you are lazy is not an excuse. Do not hunt if that's going to be you. All right, so here's some general steps that you can take to be effective at blood trailing. After you shoot a deer, wait at least half an hour before you attempt to blood trail that deer. Unless you see the deer dead in front of you as you're sitting in that tree stand or that blind, do not leave where you're at for about half an hour. You want to let the woods calm down a little bit. Then you're going to go to where the deer was standing, the general area. And before you get there, you start looking hard and close at the ground for blood. Look all around. If, you're, if you shot a bow, look for your arrow. But start looking before you get to the spot where you think that deer was standing. That way, you, there's no possible way that you walk over the uh, arrow, step on a broadhead, or step on a blood trail and really mess it up. <clears throat> so what you're doing is you're looking for blood, you're looking for your arrow. If you Obviously, if you shot with a rifle, there's probably not going to be as much blood, but there can still be blood. <clears throat> um, now look at the way the blood is going. In this picture, you can see that the blood is kind of mostly concentrated up near the bottom and goes kind of up on the picture as if the hog was running in that direction. Um, that was the case. There was basically a bright red trail through the woods uh, for hundreds of yards because this hog just wouldn't stop bleeding, but it was super easy to follow. So you could be seeing signs like this, or you could see just a drop here and there. If you're seeing just a drop here and there, I hate to tell you, but that deer may, may survive. And without a good uh, indication, like lots of blood on the ground, I would tell you to wait even longer to continue blood trailing that deer. You do not want to jump that deer uh, while it's wounded and have it run all day long just trying to ensure that it gets away from you and then die somewhere that you'll never be able to find it. What you want to do is wait. You could wait a few hours, six hours, sometimes overnight, depending on how cool it is where you're at, and come back, giving that deer enough time to die. That's really what you're doing. The last thing that you want to do, I know we said we want to give these deer the quickest death possible, but it is very hard to get a second shot on a deer that's already wounded, and it's very hard to sneak up on a deer. Okay, so some tr problems that you might run into. Let's say you've been following these drops of blood and all of a sudden it stops. What I would tell you to do is to mark that last place where you found blood with something a little bit more obvious than just a drop of blood. If you have a hat on and you can take it off, take the hat off, hang it from a branch. If you have something bright colored with you, I recommend taking out some bright orange tape tear it off, hang it from a tree limb right above where the blood was, you'll have a nice visual indicator of where that animal's going should you kind of lose track of where you're at. Now, the last place you found that blood, you start looking in the direction it was moving. Start walking very slowly and get low to the ground looking for blood in the direction it was moving. If you don't find any blood, what you're going to want to do is head back to that blood and now think about looking at trails, look at natural funnels and see, okay, you know, based on how this animal has been moving the whole time I've been tracking it, it seemed like it was going to go left, but it might've gone right here. So then you check, you know, the most obvious places to you where that animal might've went. Um, 
if uh, you just can't find anything at all, the best thing to tell you is get a tracker out there. Somebody who has a blood tracking, blood trailing dog that knows how to sniff out a dead deer. That is probably your best bet. Um, if you're tracking at night, you're going to want a flashlight. Um, sometimes certain flashlights are made for blood trailing and those can work during the daytime to kind of illuminate that blood a little bit more. I'd recommend one of those. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I would tell you is don't get so focused in on blood trailing that while you're blood trailing, you spook the deer that you're trying to find. Um, that sounds maybe a little bit silly, but you'd be surprised. You're looking so close at a drop of blood that might be this small on the ground and you're getting down low to the ground to find it. You're probably making more noise than you should be. And you want to make as least noise as possible. And you're probably alerting that deer if it's anywhere nearby of your presence and giving it a chance to run away. So you want to be very, very careful about your presence being known in the woods and uh, lighting up the woods, basically. You don't want to scare off all the deer. So field dressing a deer, there's a number of ways to do that. <clears throat> um, I ge generally would tell you uh, always have a knife. And then, you know, if, if you want, I would recommend having some gloves and potentially bringing a saw as well. Um, I'm going to give you the down and dirty. And in another video, I will describe the whole process to you as I like to do it. The down and dirty is kind of what this diagram is showing. You're going to cut a around the anus, right? Then you're going to cut from that circle around the anus all the way up to about mid chest. Um, if you plan on mounting the deer, you don't have to necessarily go that high up, but I would, I would bring it up to here usually. Um, then what you're going to do is cut away all the organs, um, from the body, essentially get all the entrails out, take the ones that you want. And, uh, if you have access to water, like clean out the deer, the body cavity of the deer. But from then on, you know, gutting the deer is basically done. You want to be careful of a few things. You don't want to nick um, areas that contain feces or urine. You don't want to cut open the stomach and have contents of the stomach all over. Basically, the only thing you're trying to do is remove these organs, remove the entrails. You're not trying to destroy them as you pull them out. But I'll get into a much deeper uh, explanation of field dressing a deer or gutting a deer um, in another video. But for now, what I would tell you to do is just to Google the process, watch five or 10 videos on the process that you like, understand it, to the point that you can memorize it and you could do it uh, the first time you got in the woods. If you don't think you'd be ready to field dress a deer and don't know how to do it, there are other options. Um, you can, if, you ha uh, if you're going to use a processor, you can bring the whole deer to a processor and they will do the whole process for you um, for a fee. But I would say as a deer hunter, it is a generally good idea to understand this process and be very familiar with it yourself. Even if you don't plan on doing this every time you shoot a deer, I believe that for your own skills, you should understand how to field dress or gut a deer in the woods. So whether you bring it to a processor or not, I would still tell you, you should understand the process of gutting the deer, even if you don't necessarily do it every time you shoot a deer. There are many technological tools that you can use to become a better hunter. Uh, one of the main tools would be apps on your smartphone. Your smartphone is a great tool to use and the apps are also awesome. I'm going to run through a couple apps. Know that at the time of filming this video, I am sponsored by zero people. So this whole video, it's all me. I'm going to show you apps that I like. If someone comes along and sponsors me, I would put it down in the description, but I highly doubt that's going to happen at any time soon. Nonetheless, let me get into this. So the first app I want to talk about is Hunt Stand. That's generally what it looks like. Yes, I know I have a lot of 
<laughs> I have a lot of apps on here uh, and a lot of notifications. So Hunt Stand is really cool because what you can do is look at the different maps on here. You can also do this thing called Hunt Zone and it'll tell you which way the wind is going. It'll tell you the wind speed and give you a 72 hour um, history of the wind. Right there makes it very obvious where the wind's blowing. Um, you can also pin your stands on here, your locations. This tool is great. You can you can do a lot of things with Hunt Stand. I use the free version, and I think Pro is probably even better, but the free version works just fine for me. The next thing I want to talk to you about is you can keep your licenses on your phone. So right there, I have Georgia, I have an Alabama uh, app as, as well. Next tool I want to talk about is Onyx Hunt. Onyx Hunt is great. If you buy a stand, sometimes they'll offer you like three months of free Onyx Hunt. And that's what I got. So that was great. I liked using that. I'm not going to go through all the features here. If you think these apps might be interesting and, and you want to use them, that's on you. You go right ahead. And the last one I want to talk to you about is DeerCast. I've had DeerCast for a couple of years now and I like it. It tells me, based on the weather and based on the information I give it about the rut, um, it tells me what times would likely be better for hunting and harvesting deer, right? So it says, today, the weather is a low of 46 and a high of 65, and it says, today, a.m. and p.m. poor. But tomorrow, it says, in the morning should be good and in the afternoon should be okay so it kind of gives you an idea without you having to take too much thought in oh will monday be a good day to hunt but before i go off of the subject of deer cast these apps are guidelines if you want to go hunt and it says it's going to be a bad day to go hunt that should not stop you hunting does not mean going out every single time and harvesting a deer Hunting means you're out actively looking to find success in harvesting a deer. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, there are also some other tools that you can use uh, that technology has really helped us out with. One of them is the trail cam. Trail cams have come a long way. Right now, if you wanted to, you could go buy 100 cell cams. Of course, you'd have to pay for each one of those plans. And you could put them up all over the area you're hunting near all sorts of deer deer sign. And you could monitor deer from the comfort of your home looking at cell phones. Now, I have some trail cameras, but I do not use trail cameras on public land at all. Now, to caveat that, I do have friends that use trail cameras on public land and they will sometimes share information with me. But... Me personally, I have not put a trail camera out on public land. Next year, I might, but I have not done it yet myself. I do keep trail cameras on private land to you know, kind of keep an eye on things and give me ideas of where to hunt. When it comes to public land, not so much. Okay, another part of modern technology is the fact that you can get an ultralight stand whether it be a climber, a hang-on, you can get climbing sticks. Very, very light these days. Now, of course, you'll have to pay to have them that light. But you can have a five-pound stand and just a couple more pounds on your back for the climbing sticks. And then a bag. And it doesn't feel like you're carrying much at all. I would highly recommend. So I'll tell you how I hunt. I hunt with a hang-on and climbing sticks. And I have practiced enough to where when I go out in the woods... It's going to take me five to 10 minutes to get set and I'm good to do, good to go. It's not going to take me half an hour. I'm not going to be making a bunch of noise. I take my time. I get up the tree in about five minutes. I'm set and the woods are calming down again. I like to do the stand setup in the early morning uh, right before the sun comes up or I like to do it, you know, midday and you know, wait a little bit longer for the sun to start going down and leave after the sun has gone down. That way I'm not really blowing up the woods too much. 
there's more about stand selection that you could get into. But first, you need to figure out what kind of stand you want. Uh, figure out if a climber, a hang on, a ladder stand would be right for you. Or if you want to be in a stand at all. Maybe you want to hunt from the ground. Maybe you want to hunt from a blind. But in order for me to give you more information about that, I'm going to do it in another video that's going to be a lot more comprehensive. Just keep in mind, um, you can utilize modern technology to be a better deer hunter, but you should also know how to hunt and harvest deer without that technology. The reason I say this is because deer hunting is a survival skill that can, that, the reason I say this is because deer hunting is a survival skill that you can carry with you for the rest of your life. If you live in an area where deer are in abundance, no matter what happens, if you have the weapons and the ammunition or the rounds or the arrows, if you have what it takes, you can go out and you can harvest a deer. Don't be relying on technology though all the time. You need to know how to do it without technology as well. Lastly, I want to talk to you guys briefly about the future of hunting and conservation efforts. I have a little graphic I put up right here. This is uh, sourced from the Quality Deer Management Association 2013. In 1900, there were 500,000 white-tailed deer. Today, 32 million. Think about that statistic. Think about that growth. Know, knowing what you know about how we live our lives today and the fact that we've somehow brought the population 60 times, more than 60 times what it was, in a hundred years, that's amazing. Um, and the thing is, it's hunters. The money that we pay for our licenses and permits and things like that, a lot of that money is what goes towards conservation effort. And it's not just deer that we're trying to save with money from hunting. It's, you know, if you know what a duck stamp is, that is another great way to save waterfowl, to do your part. Um, every time you buy a license, uh, a permit for hunting and go out there and do that, a certain portion of that is going to go towards conservation. So yeah, your goal is to harvest the deer, but you're also trying to ensure that deer in general live on and that we don't just decimate their populations. We want them to be a source for us to, yes, hunt and harvest, but we also want white-tailed deer in general to live and thrive in the wilderness in current day. If you made it this far, you probably have a thousand comments, a thousand questions. Maybe you would like to argue with some of the things I said. That's fine. There are a lot of different opinions when it comes to hunting. Understand that this video was just the beginning of deer hunting. This was not a comprehensive guide to all aspects of deer hunting. Now, I didn't talk about how to properly aim a bow, how to properly shoot a bow. I didn't talk about how to tune a bow. I didn't talk about anything to do with really aiming or sighting in a rifle either. So, there's a lot of areas I didn't talk about. There's a lot of areas I did talk about. In the future, I will be breaking down each segment into this video into fully comprehensive videos of their own, not just scratching the surface, but giving you quite a bit more detail. I hope that this video gives you somewhere to start, gives you an idea of what you're getting into, and, and really I hope that this acts as a good starting point and gets the right questions in your head, the right ideas in your head when it comes to thinking about deer hunting. If you're already an expert at deer hunting or have been deer hunting a very long time and you think some of the th things I said could be corrected or made a little bit more clear, go ahead and put them in the comments. I'd appreciate any help you can give. If you're watching this video and it's deer hunting season, good luck. If it's not deer hunting season, you have a lot more time to research and get ready. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, please hit the subscribe button. Leave a comment if you want. I'll talk to you guys next time.